Alright, I am back with another build, and today we are doing another Origin character build, this time for Astarian. Now, when I when I made the April Fool's video last week, and I was like, and I said something about, oh, you know, me wanting to return to the Origin character and do more Origin character builds, that part wasn't a joke. I'm legitimately going to be going back over some of these characters and experimenting with new concepts, and then I kind of realised something. Now, I will say right off the bat, spoilers for Astarian's storyline pretty much all the way into Act 3. I mean, I did my best to avoid spoilers with the other Origin builds, which is why I didn't touch on certain topics with Astarian when I made that build. However, I am going to be touching on those topics this time, and it is pretty much going to spoil his entire storyline, so if you've not seen it and you don't want spoilers, click off this video now. Otherwise, we're going to be building for Ascendant Astarian today, and I'm putting a twist on it. So think, think about it like this, right? So we have Astarian, yeah, obviously. Uh, and a as the story goes, you know, he finds himself on the Nautiloid, he thanks to the tadpole, he's free from the sun, uh, the sun's kind of rays, and is able to walk about freely, and is finally, for the first time, pretty much his own man, or is getting to that point. And I think, in a slight twist, and you could play this as a Starian as a member of your party, or as the origin of Starian, which I personally recommend actually playing as a Starian for this build, I think he would kind of have a slightly different outlook, just something slightly more unhinged. I think Astarian would look at what he is, and what he could be, what was taken from him, and just have an un... like, just an unrivaled hatred, an unrivaled fury for undead. Mostly vampires, obviously, but undead in general, just absolutely a abhors it, and I think he would set out to kill as many vampires as he would, as he can. And as such, Vampire Hunter Astarian is born. And I think, as we go through the game, killing as many different undead as we can, taking out vampires, learning about Astarian's past, learning how to get to Kazador, and all this sort of thing, I think when it comes to the final decision to do the ritual, he would see the, the the ability to kill maybe hundreds of vampires in a fell swoop and ascend to the point where he could be a daywalking vampire, have all that power to continue what is in his mind sort of a like a righteous hunt, a crusade. I think he'd do it. So this is an interesting take on Astaria, not going ascended just for the power and to be able to rule over others, but of course, that is what will happen because absolute power corrupts absolutely. He does it with the intention of ridding the world of what he sees as a blight, the thing that ruined his life. And that's kind of the direction I'm taking this. And yes, I'm just going to get this out of the way. Daywalking Vampire, especially with the equipment that I have, I have turned Astarian into Blade. <laughs> Pretty much. Maybe a proper, actual, in-depth research Blade build will be warranted in the future. Regardless, let's get into the build. Now, you do actually have an option at the start here. I originally went with Ranger to start this build, getting things like uh, Sanctified Stalker, for the Sacred Flame cantrip, because I do believe this version of Astarian would take uh, the liberties of learning radiant damage spells and techniques in order to be able to more effectively take down vampires. You could get Sanctified Stalker, as well as Wasteland Wanderer Cold or Fire to get those resistances. Fire is kind of the meta pick, because obviously Fire is the most common damage type, but I think Cold would make more sense. A vampire having resistance to Cold damage makes more sense in my head, and you could get things, because we would go to level 2 of Ranger, you could get things like Hail of Fawns for like interesting ranged attacks, and Hunter's Mark. Um, I mean, that's entirely up to you, um, if you wanted to go that route, but in the end, this build does have a concentration spell that it does quite like to use, and with this build, it's going to be having a slightly middling constitution. Without that constitution saving throw proficiency, you're going to have a bit of a bad time. But you may find that other strategies work for you, and you might prefer using Ranger, like maybe you're doing a bit more of a hit and run range strategy. Then honestly, I would recommend Ranger. It has better flavoring, it has like uh, some unique level 2 abilities, like I said with Hunter's Mark, which would make sense for a build like this, and Hail of Fawns for, for a cool ranged attack. Ensnaring Strike as well, if you wanted to go down that road. It kind of gives more of that, like, Hunter vibe. But I'll be going with Fighter for this build, because overall I do think it is probably a little bit stronger. Getting something like getting things like Action Surge and Constitution Saving Throw Proficiency is going to be really, really helpful. But 
both would work. So it's either going to be two levels of fighter or two levels of ranger to start this build. Feel free to choose. So with fighter, we're going to be picking up our fighting style and we are going with two weapon fighting because this is a dual wielding build. I know this is kind of how I always build a Starion, but it just fits for him being able to dual wield and two weapon fighting is going to help with that, allowing us to uh, add our ability modifier to the damage of offhanded attacks. So basically the same as a main weapon now. We also have our stats here and they're going to be a little bit strange. We are going to be taking dexterity to 17. Uh, this is going to allow us to use Ethel's Boon to push this up to an 18. We're only getting two feats with this build and th as and this build is pretty uh, multi-ability score dependent so we are going to want to kind of eke out stats wherever we can and getting an 18 in um, dexterity here uh, through Ethel's Boon and then bumping that up to a 20 later is going to uh, really help us. Um, but you, if you don't want to use Ethel's Boon, you will kind of finish this build with an 18 in Dex and an 18 in our other stat that we need, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, which will be fine, but it won't be optimal. This is the optimal way to do it. Again, this is kind of why I recommend playing this as the Astarian Origin, because if you're playing as the Astarian Origin as well, you're going to get way more dialogue options and such like that that you can kind of use to roleplay this version of Astarian a bit more effectively, rather than him just being a party member. Uh, as for our other main stat, it is going to be Wisdom. Again, this is kind of a holdover from the Ranger levels, but it is also important for uh, another class we're going to be using as well. You've probably already guessed. So, you know, we want Wisdom at a decent level. And finally, Constitution at 14 here, again, kind of middling, but it's the best we can kind of do at the moment, and it will be more than enough for this build. And finally, Charisma at 10. I would love this higher, and if you're going for, and if you're not using Ethel's Boom, bump this down to a 16 and put this at a 12, but, you know, this is the kind of final stats prep we're working with. As for our skills, I believe Astarian starts with the charlatan background, giving him sleight of hand and deception. Because he's a high elf, he also gains perception as well. And we get to pick two um, skill proficiencies from the fighter list. I think intimidation and insight are perfect for a build like this. At fighter level two, we're going to be picking up action surge, allowing us to get an extra action once per short rest. I mean, you know what it is. It's one of the best skills in the game. Now we're going to be jumping over to our main class for this build, Monk. That's right. Whenever, so you think about it. If again, if we're going with the Blade inspiration, and I really wanted to make Astarian like a master of all fighting styles here, being able to be effective in both range and melee. So we're kind of going for almost like a John Wick esque gun fu style. Uh, where we can use melee weapons, and we will be using melee weapons, but we're also going to be using like crossbows and martial arts kicks and pa 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 and a bunch of different like tricky strategies to move all over the map. And Monk is perfect for this. We're going to get things like flurry of blows, unarmored defense, uh, increased movement speed, everything we want, uh, better unarmed strikes, perfect. Everything we want for this build, Monk is going to give us. And at level 2, we're going to get those increased movement speed buffs, as well as the ability to uh, use Patient Defense, Step of the Wind, Dash, and Disengage. Um, patient Defense is really the only one I'd kind of use for this build, uh, but in the early levels, you might get a little bit of use out of Dash and Disengage, but Patient Defense is kind of the main one here. Next up at level 3, we get to pick our subclass, and it kind of doesn't really matter what you want to go for here. Way of the Open Hand would obviously be the big power choice, giving you the different flurries of blows, but the way this build works, I really want to play Way of Shadow. Way of Shadow fits perfectly for someone who is kind of using vampiric abilities, giving you the ability to hide as a bonus action, use Pass Without Trace to make the whole party stealthy, use Darkness to give ourselves a big cloud of darkness that we can sit in, uh, blinding creatures, giving them disadvantage to hit us, but us advantage to hit them. Oh, absolutely brilliant. Very vampiric. Perfect for someone who is like a vampire hunter who, again, if you're fighting against vampires, you probably want to keep them away from you for the most part. So being able to disengage, blind, do all that stuff, it's going to be perfect. This is going to enable the typical darkness strategy that we love. Uh, we get dark vision. And we also get silence as well. And again, if you're up, and I think this makes sense for Astarian to pick this up specifically because Kazador is a known spellcaster, so he's going to want something to counteract that if he can. So I think picking up silence also works. And Minor Illusion is great for all those stealthy strategies. At Monk Level 4, we're going to get Slow Fall, making us resistant to fallen damage, as well as our first feat, which I'm going to take to grab an ability score improvement and bump our dexterity up to 19 for a total of 20 with Ethel's Boon. Now, I will quickly point out some feats here that would obviously work for this build, but the main one is Sharpshooter. I'm not going to be taking it in this build because, again, with the way the, uh, the kind of stats work, I need the ability score improvements more. 
But if you're doing some sort of endgame stuff, for example, the mirror, which is the most I can say without spoilers, you may be able to finagle your stats in a way that you can actually pick up Sharpshooter, which would be a big buff to this build. So if you know what you're doing, make that work, but it's not necessary for this build, you will do fine without it. But again, with things like being able to give ourselves advantage on attacks and all that, Sharpshooter can work out for us. But overall, I don't think we need it. Dual wielder could also be an option if you want to dual wield weapons that aren't light, but we are using light weapons here, so it's not really a big deal for us. Crossbow expert could also be kind of good if you want to be able to use your crossbows in melee as well, but that's entirely up to you. But I'm mainly going to be taking ability score improvements for this build. Next up among level 5, we're going to be getting extra attack, meaning that now we can make two attacks uh, with our action. Getting this slightly later than usual, obviously about two levels later, but it's not a big deal for this build. Again, as a dual wielding build, we'll be able to basically have extra attack a bit earlier anyway. It just uses our bonus action, so you're not going to feel as bad as a martial fighter, but now you're going to feel even better. We're also going to be picking up Stunning Strike, which is a really great ability. We're going to be able to use this to stun our target with either our melee or unarmed strikes, provided the... Uh, don't pass the saving frame. So overall, this can be used to kind of keep our enemies in a kind of a stun lock. Also, as a, as a way of Shadow's Monk, we're going to be grabbing Cloak of Shadows, allowing us to wrap ourselves in shadow and become invisible if we are obscured. So, for example, if we're in our Cloud of Darkness, or another method of being able to blind our foes, which I'll get to later, uh, we will be able to basically turn invisible whenever we want at the cost of our action, giving us a guaranteed sneak attack whenever we want to use it. And again, and I guess I just kind of spoiled, yes, we are taking rogue levels in this build, a Starian is a rogue after all, so we will be able to get sneak attack off every so often. And next up, at monk level 6, our final level of monk, we're going to get a bit more movement speed, key empowered strikes to allow our um, punches to overcome resistance to and immunity to non-magical damage, and shadow step, allowing us to teleport from shadow to shadow, and after we do so, we have advantage on our next melee attack roll, because we can use things like darkness to be able to basically... Um, make ourselves uh, obscured, heavily obscured, which is what you need for Shadow Step. You need to be able to teleport to and from lightly or heavily obscured areas. Being able to create an obscured area and then teleport out of it to be able to put some range between us and our opponents so we can move away from them and keep spamming them with ranged attacks while they keep trying to dash after us to get close. You can see, you can all kind of see in the combat footage that I, while I did kind of start off with a more bold strategy of using darkness, I ended up, because it was such a large encounter, having to kind of do hit and run tactics with this sort of strategy. And you'll see it works out really, really nice. So, Shadow Step, one of the key abilities of this build. And now we are done with Monk and we're going to move over to Rogue, as I said. Rogue is going to get a sneak attack with both our melee and ranged attacks, which is nice, giving us a bit of extra damage. We're also going to be able to get a couple of skills, and we're actually going to be picking up skill, uh, the, the stealth skill. I know it's weird for a Starian to not get stealth until level 9, but that's just how the cookie crumbles. But again, you can change the order of these levels if you so choose. This build is not reliant on any specific level at any given point. In fact, the rogue levels might be better to take before the monk levels, because getting uh, the extra bonus action, which yes, we are taking Thief, could substitute for that missing extra attack, still getting three attacks off in a turn, if you're dual wielding. So we're going to get stealth and sleight of hand expertise here. Next up at Rogue Level 2, we're going to be able to now hide, dash, and disengage. We could already hide for no cost, but being able to dash and disengage without spending our key points is really, really nice. Next up, up, we are going to be getting our subclass, and I've already said it, we're going with Thief. As much as I'd love to grab Assassin or Arcane Trickster, Thief is just the power option here, giving us a second bonus action, as well as resistance to falling damage, again, kind of funny, but mainly the second bonus action, allowing us now to make four attacks in a turn between our uh, main hand action with extra attack and our two bonus actions. This is one of the most classic builds, it was one of the most powerful builds just to grab uh to dual wield with um three frog back in the day especially with dual crossbows and it's still extremely strong today and finally at rogue level four we get to pick up a new feat and we obviously are going to be going for an ability score improvement here to bump up our wisdom again if you do some stat finagling you can or use some different equipment than the ones i'll be showing in a minute you might be able to make this a bit more optimized maybe get 20 strength and 20 wisdom or bump to your constitution but this is the kind of stats we're going for for now but i can show off some other methods to get better stats in a minute and that is the build. As you can see, I've actually set the stage and taken us to um, a certain castle in Act 3. And as such, we are here now. With the build 
basically you're getting a really, really fun playstyle. Uh, melee attacks, ranged attacks, martial arts, uh, you're getting the ability to create shadows, get advantage on your attacks, dash around the battlefield with dashing, disengaging, uh, shadow teleport, turning invisible, stunning strike, sneak attack, all this fun stuff, you're gonna feel like an absolute badass taking advantage of your vampiric abilities. Like as we see here, Astarian also has his vampire bite, which if you ascend will become the ascendant bite, which synergizes really well with monk, if you know you know. So honestly, this build is going to be super fun to play. You're going to, it fits perfectly for Starion being able to just be this misty shadow that scurries across the battlefield and deals massive damage out of seemingly nowhere. I personally really, really like this build. It's actually one of my favorite ones that I've kind of come up with recently. So please give it a try. I think it's quite fun. But let's move on to the equipment. Let's get a Starion in the short. Yes, my boy. Right. So uh, here we have the equipment here. Now, a lot of, now, I'll get into the weapons first. <laughs> I'm kind of all over the place today. Uh, the weapons I've chosen to go for here is RV Justitia Scimitar and Rhapsody. But Justitia Scimitar can be picked up in Act 2. If you attack with advantage, you have, attack, you have a chance of blinding your target. So, while we kind of blind our targets already, this is kind of another way of doing it. The main reason we, get, we want this is because it's a plus 2 light weapon that looks kind of cool for our build. It kind of fits with the vibe. Um, and basically it comes with a unique special attack as well called Shadow Soaked Blow, uh, adding our proficiency bonus to the damage, and if it hits, it deals an additional 1d6 psychic damage, and this attack does not break concealment if you are hiding. So overall, it just works out quite nicely as a weapon for Astarian. I think it looks quite nice for this build. And in our offhand, we are using the Rhapsody Dagger. Now, obviously, you get this dagger for beating Kazador in Act 3, so by this point, well, by the time you have this dagger, you should already be Ascendant. Astarian. So with this, uh, you're going to gain a plus one bonus to attack, damage, and spell save DC uh, for every foe you slay up to a maximum of plus three, meaning that all of our attacks are going to be significantly more powerful. This weapon also does an extra 1d4 of piercing damage, which might be because of a ring we're wearing, I just realized. I don't know why I pointed that out. Uh, we can also possibly inflict bleeding on a creature while hitting with this weapon while we're hiding or invincible. Again, we're pretty much going to be able to hide or turn invisible in plain sight whenever we like, so we're going to be able to get a lot of uses out of this. Uh, but of course, Rhapsody is an Act 3 weapon that we get after a major boss fight, so for a couple of our options for your offhand, we have a few here. In both in Act 1, you can grab either the Knife of the Undermountain King to be able to give yourself a uh, higher chance to make critical hits, reducing the threshold by 1, uh, and whenever you roll a 2 on your damage die or less, you re-roll the die, taking higher roll, and you have advantage on attack rolls against slightly or heavily obscured creatures. You might prefer having this in your main hand over the Justitia Scimitar and go with the Rhapsody with this instead. It's entirely up to you, I think that actually but they both work, but I quite like the Justitia Scimitar as well, but feel free to change this up however you like. I kind of like the Justitia Scimitar more theme-wise, but the Knife of the Under Mountain King is probably the power building option and in fact, next to Rhapsody, looks kind of nice. They kind of complement each other a little bit. But again, as another Act 1 option for if you don't want to use a short sword and you want to use a dagger, we have the Sousa Dagger, which is just a regular plus one dagger that you get to go on a fun little side quest to get, and it silenced the target on hit. So again, dealing with those pesky spellcasters. Uh, looks pretty cool as well, but I personally would say maybe dual-wield the uh, Justicia Scimitar and the Knife of the Undermountain King until you get Rhapsody. And then, yeah, you're going to have a pretty powerful combination. As, and as well for our ranged weapons, of course, I'm going with the classic dual crossbow combo. We are going to be dual wielding with this build, so I want to be able to use it uh, with range as well. We're going to get the Hellfire Hand Crossbow, which is going to allow us to possibly inflict burning while hitting a creature with this weapon while hiding or invisible. I think this actually makes a lot of sense for Astarian with this kind of vampire hunter thing, because with... Because there's kind of that thing in fiction where vampires are vulnerable to fire in a lot of different cases. And again, because we can basically be hiding or invisible whenever we like, uh, we're going to be able to basically inflict burning quite a lot. This is one of the only plus two hand crossbows in the game as well. And it also comes with the ability to cast Scorching Ray Shot. So Astarion is bringing fired, radiant. I mean, he would definitely craft some of them, those uh, holy water grenades that you can get in this game. I, unless I'm remembering that wrong. I'm pretty sure there's holy water grenades in this game. Um, so he's bringing everything. He is the vampire hunter, and I absolutely love it. And then also we have the near miss. This is a plus one, um, plus one weapon, but it makes up for it in the fact that this weapon does pure 
force damage, which is a nice alternate damage type to have. There is another plus two hand crossbow in the game, but it's in Act Three, and you have to do and you have to get it from a pretty hard like lock picking check, which obviously a starring could do. But this one I think is better because it gives you an alternative damage type to use and comes with the ability to cast magic missile at, at level three as well. So again, another solid damage option. Uh, basically, combining these two together, you pick them both up in Act Two is going to make you a really solid range combatant. Perfect for this build. Next up, we have our our actual equipment. Let's start off with the headpiece, the Hell Dusk Helmet. This is mainly here because it makes us immune to being blinded, meaning that we cannot um, we're not affected by our own darkness spell. Uh, this is an Act 3 option. Up until then, you might want to pick up something like the Eversight Ring uh, for this build, but once you get the Helldust Helmet, you can substitute the ring for this. This is also going to give us a plus two bonus to saving throws against spells, which is nice. Attacks cannot land critical hits against us, which is great. And we also get a unique ability called Immolating Gaze, which allows us to sear and frighten targets with nothing but your glower. So overall, I think this is going to be a pretty solid headpiece. Again, you can pick this up in Act 3 pretty much right away if you know where to go as well. So it's going to be a very solid option for us. But obviously, this is an Act 3 option. So until then, honestly enough, the Diadem of Arkeem Synergy will work. Now, I orig again, this is from when this build was originally a Ranger build. And if you have a Hunter's Mark, uh, this will work. But actually, it should work with the Blinded Condition as well. Well, whenever you inflict a condition, you gain Arcane Synergy for two turns, which Arcane Synergy is going to add our um, spellcasting modifier to the attack and damage rolls of our uh, of our weapon attacks, or just the damage rolls, actually, I believe. Yes, just the damage rolls. Uh, because we are a monk, our spellcasting ability modifier should be Wisdom, so this means we're going to get a bit of extra damage on our attacks as well. So, yeah, you can use this up until then, or something, you know, like uh, the Helmet of Arcane Acuity, maybe, or maybe even the... Um, you know, the haste helm for a bit of momentum to give you even more movement speed, you know, something along those lines. Uh, next up is our cloak, the Cloak of Cunning Broom. Whenever we disengage, which remember we can basically do for free since we have two bonus actions, um, and can do so as a bonus action, we create a foggy cloud within a two meter radius that lasts for one turn. This is basically going to allow us to make enemies around us blinded whenever we like. We don't even have to use our concentration or anything. We just need to click the disengage button and we're good to go. This is going to give us opportunities to be able to escape with shadow teleport and other things like that. So pretty good overall. Basically a requirement for this build to get the full uh, kind of strategy out of it. Definitely works. Next up, this is kind of a flavor choice, so feel free to replace this with whatever you like, but I would recommend clothing for the movement speed. This is the Veil of Mourning. It says, let, it's got an ability called Let the Undead Blotch with Fear. Very dramatic. Undead have disadvantage on attack rolls against you. Perfect for this build. And you have advantage on saving throws against their actions and spells. You also gain the cleric ability to use Turn Undead, which I think is perfect for Astarian. Pick that one up from Shadowheart. Uh, unfortunately, this is an Act 3 auction option, and I will show you kind of what it looks like uh, without the camp clothing. I've got like a slightly alternate like kind of version of this for camp clothing uh, from from the mod uh, Extra Gear as camp clothing. Um, but because I, I felt like this was just a little bit too extra. <laughs> And I think this is slightly more muted, and I think would have for Suta story in a bit more, I guess. But I could see, but this is kind of like what the vanilla look would be. So it doesn't look too bad vanilla, but I kind of prefer this personally. Uh, but yeah, basically, I think this is perfect for a build like this, literally V vampire kind of anti vampire robe. But again, an act three option. So I, so I would say in the early game, pick up the graceful cloth. Which, that well, kind of works, but again, feels a bit too much, which is why I like the camp clothing. Uh, the Graceful Cloth is going to give you a plus two to your dexterity, so in the early game this can be really useful, especially when we're multi-ability score dependent. In fact, if you don't care about using um, our the Veil of Morning, you could stick with this and pop your uh, second ability score improvement into either Sharpshooter or Wisdom to optimize this build a bit further if you like, if you don't mind, you know, kind of losing the kind of flavor stuff. Uh, here and also this is going to give you a plus one to deck saves and increasing your jump distance as well giving you even more maneuverability around the battlefield this is probably the more powerful option to pick just from a raw stat perspective but come on you can't deny that the veil of morning is literally perfect for this build but again you can pick this one up in act one and be pretty solid throughout the game Next up for our gloves, we have the Seraphic Pugilist Gloves. Yarn armed attacks deal an additional radiant damage. Again, going straight for the undead with that one. We also gain the ability to cast Guiding Bolt as a level 4 spell once per long rest, so we're getting like kind of a radiant bl blast 
So in the end, I think that's going to work perfect for this build. Again, I feel like Astarion would learn some radiant damage stuff since he's not vulnerable to it anymore and would absolutely use this to clean house on vampires. But if you don't feel like radiant damage is really Astarion's thing, and again, this is an Act 3 option, we do have some early game and some alternatives. In the early game, from the same vendor you'd pick up the Graceful Cloth from, you can get the Gloves of Cinder and Sizzle, turning that in radiant damage into fire damage, which again, makes sense for fighting vampires, as well as giving you the ability to use Scorching Ray at a level 3 once per long rest, so two uses of Scorching Ray per long rest is really nice, although I think the Hellfire Hand Crossbow version is short rest, yeah, so you're getting it quite a lot. Um, yeah, so that could be a decent early game option for you, uh, or if you want another Act 3 option that isn't Radiant Damage, if you really don't think Astarion would use it, we have the Servitor of the Black Hand Gloves, which I think also fits, turning that Radiant or Fire damage into extra Force damage, and also giving the ability to cast for Fear spell, which I do think is in line with Astarion as well, so feel free to pick up whatever you like here, but I quite like the idea of having Radiant Damage against those undead. And finally, for the boots, we have the Disintegrating Nightwalkers. Again, perfect at one option, making it so we can't be unwebbed, entangled, or ensnared, so we're always able to kind of get out of the vampire's grasp. And I think Vistarion might have a bit of past trauma that would make it so he doesn't want to be, let's just say, ensnared or entangled. And we also can't slip on grease or ice, as well as gaining the ability to use Misty Step once per short rest. So if for some reason you absolutely cannot get that Shadow Teleport off, Misty Step will allow you to teleport anyway. It's basically kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card for us which is great. Perfect for this build. And on, now on to the accessories. Uh, the, next, the amulet is a bit more of a flavor choice. This is the amulet of the Wind Rider, giving you the ability to ride the winds or create a gust of wind. I kind of picked this because Ascendant Astarian does get the ability to turn into like a cloud and all that sort of thing. So this is kind of like a diet version of that. And I kind of wanted to bring it up just in case you wanted to use this build, but maybe don't do the Ascendant. You can still kind of get that same sort of flavor. Uh, but you really, you can replace this with whatever you like. It really doesn't matter. I've just not really used this amulet very much. Wanted to show it off. And you can get, so yeah, basically you get a uh, cloud. What's it, what's the ability called? Misty form? Cloud form? I don't know. Basically, you get to transform into a cloud, becoming resistant to all damage and gain advantage on con, decks and strength saves and are tiny in size. So you can like move through small, small, small spaces and such. Again, mostly a flavor thing. This is basically the closest we're going to get into turning into a bat. <laughs> and finally, Gust of Wind, allowing us to summon a strong wind that clears all uh, clouds and pushes creatures back five meters, forcing them off balance. Again, just kind of a flavor here. Feel free to swap that out for whatever you like. The Shadow Cloaked Wing. Wing! School you have it. Shadow cloaked ring. Uh, the wearer, uh, the wearer's weapon and unarmed attacks. So everything that we do deal an additional one d four damage against lightly or heavily obscured creatures and creatures made of shadow. Again, we create our own lightly or heavily obscured areas with darkness and the uh, the fog cloud. So we're able to get off this extra damage bonus pretty much whenever we like. As well as the strange conduit ring, since we're going to be concentrating on darkness, uh, we're going to be able to get that extra psychic damage on our all of our weapon attacks quite a lot, which is really nice. Um, obviously, if you're not using the Helldust Helm, you would probably swap the Strange Conduit Ring out here for the um, uh, the Eversight Ring to be able to get over that blindness, but overall, this setup should work pretty nicely. Okay, and yeah, that is the build. Overall, I think you're getting a ton out of this. I think this type of build makes gets a lot out of the Ascendant abilities, which I didn't use for this combat showcase, because again, that would mean I'd have to fight Kazador and do all this other stuff and like blah 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 and I just don't have the time man but just so you know this build is not operating at full power and yet it was still able to clear this entire room of werewolves, vampiric rats, a uh, vampire that actually came into the room, uh, the bats and the wolves and all that which I didn't kill the wolves I specifically switched the pass the, to um, knocking out damage non-lethal damage for those guys because I'm not going to kill them they're cute um, but yeah, so overall, like I said, what you're going to be able to get this, out of this is a ton of different combat strategies, and all of them are quite powerful. Cast darkness on yourself, go to town with melee attacks, run around the room, teleport around the rooms, keep your enemies at bay, forcing them to come towards you, and beat them down with uh, your ranged attacks. Being able to get off spells, turn invisible, get sneak attacks, do all this, that, and the other thing, you're going to be feeling pretty strong by the time all is said and done. And again, I mean... The only things I can see this build having trouble with is, again, the slightly lower constitution. We go with fighter to get the constitution saving for proficiencies, but if your enemies are lucky enough to get an attack off on you, even at disadvantage, there is a pretty decent chance that you're going to drop concentration, uh, and which happened to me a couple of times in this combat showcase, which is unfortunate. I always seem to get really unlucky with concentration saves. I don't know what it is. I can have a build be, like, 
20 constitution with constitution saving for proficiency and disadvantage to hit, and I will still lose concentration. It I, boggles my mind. I'll even go as far as to equip the boots of striding, just so I can't be knocked prone so I don't lose concentration that way, and somehow, somehow, it still happens. It's such a pain in the butt. But again, this build operates brilliantly. Again, you have multiple strategies that you can work with. It's all within the flavor. You get to feel like this badass kind of martial artist, gun food type character, like I said. It feels really, really fun. And I think this take on Astarian is brilliant. And again, you get the Ascendant powers and you will be off to the races. This build will suddenly skyrocket in power as all of those things synergize quite nicely. Uh, as far as channel update stuff, uh, I'm working on a couple of projects. Uh, obviously, now I'm kind of returning to Origin builds as well, just for a little bit of fun. Uh, I'm going to be doing some Elden Ring builds on the channel as well. Specifically, I'm going to be doing on Wednesday another Astarian build, but this time recreating him in Elden Ring because I have a few interesting ideas on how to do that. As well as I am working on a big, big project, as I've alluded to in my previous video. Uh, that I'm working on a very, very big video project that is taking a lot of time. I've got hundreds of gigabytes worth of footage that I need to get through. I'm still recording the footage. Editing it together shouldn't be too bad because I've got to like record off a script and all that, which I never actually do for these videos. All, all of my videos that you see are just off the cusp. Like none of this is scripted, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> and, and as such, going into scripted content again for the first time in years... It's been an interesting journey, so basically what I'm doing is I'm kind of playing through a game, writing the script as I go, about kind of about various different things, because I'll, I'll give you a hint, it's a challenge run. It's a challenge run of a video game, and the, and the journey that it's taken to get to this point is crazy, uh, it, but again, a lot of the time I've spent has been actually, you know, grinding the game out and like getting to a point where, you know, I can actually beat the game, because you'll see what I mean when you see the video, it gets pretty insane. Uh, and then I've got to, once the footage is all together, I've got to record all the voice lines, and then I have to... Uh, edit and all that and it's going to take a while to come out but I'm really really hoping it's going to be worth it in the end again it's hundreds of gigabytes of footage that I have to go through like I've had to like store them across multiple hard drives because I just don't have the space on my computer that's how much we're dealing with here because I wanted to keep the video at the same quality that I normally would with these videos you know the 1440p and all that but I'm, and with the lossless quality but I'm and that's great for one-off videos like this but for a big project like this yeah, this one's going to take me a while, <laughs> but I'm really, really excited to show it off to you guys. It's it's going to, I really want to go all in on the editing on it and actually turn it into something really fun for you. Uh, again, because I, I, I mean, I produce these videos. These are kind of just like my simple ba basic content that I make, uh, which with slightly lower effort, most of the effort for these builds goes into the creative side of things, actually making the builds and, you know, coming up with unique concepts and such. The actual video making side of things isn't too much of a big deal. Whereas, um, so this is kind of the way I'm able to make videos as frequently as I do. And back when I started this channel, I was doing it every day. But with this now, um, this new video, it's a whole new kettle of fish. But I like to be able to show off my actual editing skills when I get the chance. I've done it a few times on the channel before. Specifically, the Lethal Company video was kind of a big editing thing for me with like tracking subtitles and all that. And the old Phasmophobia, video Phasmophobia videos that I used to do with that sort of thing back when my PC was shit because it was seven years old. So I'm kind of glad to be able to go back to uh, that kind of style. I'll be interested to see how the video does, because again, you try and introduce new stuff and it doesn't usually work out, but we'll see. Uh, the reason I've been rambling on for so long is because I know this combat footage is quite long today, so I wanted to make sure that we got as much of it in, in as I can before I, you know, disappear into the darkness once again. Uh, but yeah, I think that is going to do it for me. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time. Yeah!